Stocks oscillate in a range after stronger than expected U.S. manufacturing data tempers rate cut expectations. Consumer durables as well as real estate eke out gains while IT and metals drag. The Aditya Billa fashion stock jumps on a move to spin off the lifestyle business of Madura fashion into a listed entity with mirror shareholding value. Retail, ethnic and luxury businesses will remain with the company in the proposed value creation move. Mixed auto sales for month of March. Uh, CV sales are weak, but two-wheeler sales are with export focus are strong. Bajaj Auto hits fresh record high after strong sales in the month of March. Volumes rise 24% YOY at 3,46,000 units. While Ashok Leland sees weakness in sales. The Secretary of the Department for Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade tells CNBC TV18 that there is a case to moderate taxes on hybrids as they reduce pollution, but the concessions will be less than for EVs. And the Secretary of Department of Pharmaceuticals tells CNBC TV18 that the uniform code on pharma marketing is based on global ethical practices. And the government will not just name and shame violators, but also impose penalties and take disciplinary action. Hi there, welcome to Business Lunch on this Tuesday afternoon. I'm Nisha Podar, with me today is Sonia Shanoi. So Sonia, after uh, the kind of record-smashing beginning to the financial year, today the market is really treading like with caution, but in a very small, tight range at mm. the moment. So let's take a look at uh, Nifty 50 uh, at lunch hour. Well, 22,420-odd levels for Nifty 50. It's marginal downtick. And in a very tight range, the movement has been seen in Nifty 50. And remember that it is 100 points below the record, all-time record levels that it had touched yesterday. Let's take a look at Sensex. It's down 175 points in trading session at the moment. Bank Nifty is comfortably in the green, but with minor gains at this point. And mid caps, that is the really spot that we need to watch out for. It is outperforming the key indices by a huge margin and closer to 1% uptake on that particular index. Advanced decline ratio because of broader market participation is way better and market strength is there. On my screen at the moment, Bajaj Auto in terms of percentage gainers is the one which is clocking in over 2.5% gain. Sonia. Oh, absolutely. You know, Nisha, uh, the market is in a very, very strong position, although the headline index may not reflect that as much. If you look at what's happening in the broader markets, right, the mid-cap index is up 1%, and a lot of people are now talking about this being a pre-election rally. So if you look at the, uh, the trends that have shaped up in the last couple of weeks, uh, both political events, macro events like the GST collection was very strong. You have the NDA strengthening further. There's a bit of a weakness increasing with the opposition as well. So uh, the market loves this when there is a continuity in terms of policy and macro stability. And that's something the street is looking at. So although the headline index may not reflect it as much, there's consolidation, but there is so much action in the broader markets. Just look at it, record highs for names like Bajaj Auto after strong March sales. Fresh highs on names like Dixon Technology, Interglobe Aviation, BEL, and these are all the darlings of the market. But let's begin business lunch by focusing on Aditya Birla fashion and retail. The stock has gained over 10% after it says that it will evaluate the potential demerger of Madura fashion and lifestyle business, which owns brands like Louis Philippe, Alan Solly, and American Eagle into two separate listed entities. Mangalam is here to tell us more. Mangalam. Well, ABFRL has announced that they will evaluate a vertical demerger of their businesses into two separate listed entities, as you can see. One would be the Madura fashion and lifestyle business. The other one would be the rest of the business. The question we are asking here is if this exercise can actually unlock value. So let's look at this whole exercise and the numbers itself. Now, as per the company's statement to the exchanges, what will each of these businesses hold? Let's start with Madura Fashion and Lifestyle Business. It'll hold brands like Louis Philippe, Van Heusen, their underwear business, which is growing extremely fast as well, Alan Soli, Peter England. Then a couple of these uh, new businesses like American Eagle, the young businesses, Forever 21, and the sports business, which is Reebok as well. This demerges and lists separately. 
The remaining ABFRL business will hold pantaloons, their vast growing ethnic wear portfolio, the luxury brands that they have, the bridge to luxury brands as well, and a bunch of digital brands known as tomorrow. So it appears with this that we can classify these businesses in two parts. One is the value generator, the other one is the growth generator. Why do I call them so? Let's start with Madura lifestyle and fashion brands. We have a 5% revenue growth for this business. Large part of the revenue comes in 63, 50 odd crores in the first nine months of this year, with almost 1000 crores of EBITDA at a margin of 15 and a half percent. Whereas the other business, the fast growing business, grew at around 21% in the first nine months of this year, with a revenue of around 4,500 crores. Of course, because it's in an investment phase, the margins are a lot lower at around 8% itself. If the current growth rate continues with additional kickers coming in from improved consumer sentiment and business focus as well for the next two years, for Madura garments, which has grown at around 5% for the first nine months of this year, we can assume a revenue compounding of 10% and an EBITDA compounding of over 12% for the next two years. And for AB fashion and retail, it's a growth driver and we will see some operating leverage as well, which is why I have assumed 22% revenue growth and 25% EBITDA compounding as well. We end up with roughly 11,000 crore revenue and 1,800 crore EBITDA for the Madura fashion and lifestyle business for FI26. Whereas for AB fashion and retail, the numbers are close to 10,000 crore on the top line with 800 crore on the EBITDA itself. The big question then is how to value these two entities. I'm looking at comparable numbers for companies like Trend. It would be then prudent to ascribe a huge discount to Trend, which trades at 45 times FY26 EV to EBITDA, and give it similar multiples to players like Arvind Fashions as well, and also given a higher multiple to the AB fashion and retail business, largely because of higher growth prospects. So look at 20x EV to EBITDA for AB fashion and retail, and 15x for Madura fashion and lifestyle itself you end up with an enterprise value of 15,700 crores for AB fashion and retail and 26,600 crores for Madura fashion and lifestyle, which takes the total enterprise value to 42,000 crore as against the 25, 26,000 crores it is at right now. Before jumping to all the conclusions, what are the factors that we should uh, focus on? The first one, what is the exact cash on books post the GIC fund infusion? What the total debt and payables are of the company? 9,300 crore as of September. Will, how will this be split between the two entities? The third one, what is the expected growth capital infusion in ABFRL and the resultant dilution on that? And finally, the path to profitability and growth for both these divisions, how they play out, will be important to see the value that will emerge from this entire exercise. All right, thanks so much, Manglam, for taking us through that big development coming in from the Aditya Birla Group company. Let's focus, focus on the auto basket now, and it's clearly a mix pack today. The top uh, nifty gainer, Bajaj Auto, is from the auto pack, and the top nifty loser in terms of percentage is also from the auto pack, Hero Moto Corp. So it's clearly a mixed bag and all owing to the kind of numbers that they have shown for the month of March. Let's take a look at this because the weak commercial vehicle sales have been impacting while two-wheeler companies with a focus on exports have put up a strong show. In fact, Sonia will tell us more about it. Tell You've pretty much summarized the whole thing. So the two-wheeler uh, sector has been very strong and commercial vehicles has been weak, right? So we're looking at Bajaj Auto first up. The stock is in fact at a record high today. It's had a dream run this year. It's up almost 36% in 2024. And if you look at it, very strong sales coming in. Domestic sales growth has been almost 18%. Overall sales growth of 25%. But the big, big recovery has come in the export front. Export sales are up almost about 25% uh, as well. Now, the company says that, okay, it's actually 39% growth on the export front. Now, the company has said that the growth in exports is largely on the back of a low base. Uh, the growth is slow and it's steady. And some markets in Africa are still reeling under the currency devaluation. Um, that we've seen and also some other markets like Bangladesh continue to see very very slow recovery. That's on Bajaj Auto. Hero Motor Corp actually has been very weak this time so the stock is down almost about two and a half percent. If you look at it the total sales are down in the month of March by about five and a half percent year on year. Uh, but uh, moving on to the commercial vehicle space there as well, sales have been under pressure. Ashok Leyland's total sales are down by 4%, medium and heavy commercial vehicle sales down by 7%. But uh, one of the other stars of the show this month has been TVS Motor. TVS Motor sales were very strong, total sales growth of around 12% and motorcycle sales growth of around 22 odd percent. In fact, staying with the auto sales, let's get a quick uh, view in from Bajaj Auto on how the month has shaped up and how much more there is to this export market recovery. 
the uh, export recovery is uh, very slow and steady. And I think uh, we have bottomed the uh, curve, but uh, the climb back is going to be very, very uh, gradual, largely because you know some of the uh, markets in Africa are still reeling under the impact of the devaluation. Uh, wh whilst the availability of currency in other parts of the world is progressively improving for trade, but the impact of devaluation is hurting large markets uh, like Nigeria, Kenya, uh, et cetera. Whereas, uh, you know, ASEAN and Latin America uh, are doing well. Uh, <clears throat> the recovery over there is pretty good. Uh, we are planning for it to be next year or this year uh, to be better than uh, the previous year. But, you know, having said that, uh, <clears throat> one thing which I want to point out in exports is if you uh, if you look at the uh, value growth, there is a value growth. There is no value decline because uh, you know the uh, parts of the business which are growing, uh, which is uh, Latin America, have a very rich mix of higher value products. When it comes to the industry, uh, of course, always uh, distribution plays a, a key role. But I think most of the major players are pretty well distributed. All right, so that's the word coming in from the auto space. Now, before we slip into a short breather on business lunch, here's something you must not miss out on CNBC TV 18. Now, we present India Exchange, where market experts and industry stalwarts will collaborate in insightful discussions on India's economic path and the evolving dynamics of the Indian market. Mapping the macros with City India economist Samiran Chakravarti, catch a jugal bandi between market veterans Manish Chokhani and Ramdeo Agarwal, return of animal spirits within India Inc., a conversation with V. Vedyanathan of IDFC First Bank, KK Mistri and Manish Kejriwal of Kedara Capital, and chasing alpha with market experts like Nilesha of Kotak, Prashant Khemka of Vito Capital and Anish Tawakle of ICICI Pro MF. Don't miss out on this. Tune in to CNBC TV 18 on 4th of April, 5.30 p.m. onwards. Welcome back to Business Lunch. Well, there are no restrictions on importing cars from China under the new EV policy as long as companies meet investment and other criteria. That's the word coming in from Rajesh Singh, the Secretary at the Department of Promotion uh, of Industry and Internal Trade. Speaking to my colleague Parikshit Lutra, he also said that he has advised all government departments to disburse production-linked incentives on a quarterly basis. Listen in. As of now, there is no, uh, you know, restriction on import from China per se. You would have seen BYD vehicles are already on the road after paying the relevant, uh, you know, import duties. So we've not, uh, the only restriction that exists in India is on the investment side, where we have a press note 3 and we have a restriction on land border countries. So, yeah, FDI in, from that area is difficult. Imports from that area is theoretically possible under the present regime. Whether we'll necessarily keep it that way, I can't take a call. But as of now, the, the in, under our ex existing policies and regulations, imports, uh, are, there is no restriction on imports. DPRT's view uh, has been, and this is again a subject of the Ministry of Heavy Industries, they can take a final call on this. Our view was that uh, uh, there is a space for uh, hybrid vehicles uh, potentially uh, to the extent that they also provide some degree of uh, fuel efficiency, uh, reduce uh, you know fossil fuel dependence and therefore they need not be kept on, on a, from a tax standpoint at exactly the same level as a pure ICE vehicle. Maybe they can be given some concession, not as much concession as the mm. uh, pure electric vehicles. That, is, that was our view. We've conveyed that to MHI. MHI can take a final call on that. There has been some, uh, you know, different sections of industry have different views on this. Some feel that uh, you should only uh, provide concessions only to the uh, pure electric vehicles and not to anybody else. Uh, but uh, to the extent that uh, our view, as I said, is that there is a middle ground for uh, 
hybrids where they perhaps can be given a, a moderate uh, concession, not the same as the, as the electric vehicle. All right, let's take it to aviation and a story which concerns you and me as consumers. Now, a day after Vistara decided to temporarily curtail its daily flight schedule, well, the aviation ministry has sought a report from the airline over flight delays as well as cancellations. In fact, tracking this development from our team are both Danish and Madiha who are joining us right here to give us the latest. First, let's take it to Danish for the latest coming in from the ministry and DGCA. What is ministry saying? saying and what are the measures taken there, Danish? Uh, well, both the Ministry of Civil Aviation as well as the Aviation Regulator, DGCA, they are acting on this issue of... We are, we are seeing that yesterday Vistara came out with a statement and they clearly informed that due to crew unavail unavailability, they will be unable to uh, fly maximum number of flights and certain flights have been cancelled and many have been delayed. Hence, uh, the Ministry of Civil Aviation is keeping a close track of the developments and uh, the DGCA, which is the Aviation Regulator, it has asked Vistara to submit a daily information report and in this daily information report, the airline has has to inform uh, the regulator about the number of flights that are cancelled and the number of flights uh, that are being delayed. So this is what has been sought by the DGCA from Vistara. But on the other end, even the Civil Asian Minister Jyotir Adit Sindhya at a personal level has stepped into uh, the Vistara crisis and he has also sought information from Vistara on the flight cancellations and what exactly is the issue that is happening in the A-line right now. Uh, as per uh, Vistara sources, uh, the, the pilots over there are kind of unhappy with the pay grade as the, as Bodhi, as Vistara is being merged with Air India, certain pilots of Vistara will have to accept uh, the pay grade that is being offered at Air India and which clearly means that so that pilots will be paid for 40 hours of flying instead of 70 that are being uh, that they're being paid right now at Vistara and hence, uh, as a sign of protest, uh, certain pilots have uh, called in sick and they are not uh, flying their uh, aircraft. Hence, we are seeing uh, that uh, because, because of this issue, uh, both the regulator, even the ministry have stepped in and they're trying to uh, solve this issue and they're trying that uh, whatever is happening with the airline uh, there is minimal uh, impact on the passengers all right uh, thanks so much danish for giving us uh, the point of view coming in and the measures being taken there but madhya has more on why the pilots are protesting and what are the contentious issues madhya tell us what's the sense also we are getting in terms of the resolution soon well, Nisha, as Danish was mentioning, this is clearly one of the pre-merger turbulences at Vistara and the pilot's unrest is something that was bound to happen. So here, here's what has led to the crisis. Several pilots are reporting sick at the last moment, leaving passengers stranded and forcing the airline to cancel flights. Now, why are they behaving like this? Their main protest is against the salary contract, which they were told to sign by the 15th of March. There is a significant change in their contract after the merger process with Air India started across departments. Now, sources tell CNBC TV team that pilots are not willing to sign as the new contract is reducing their fixed flying allowance from 70 hours earlier to 40 hours, which is what Air India pilots also get. It is learned that this is mostly affecting the first officers of the narrow body A320 fleet. Now, pilots who I spoke to said this change will nearly half their salaries and cause a reduction of as much as 90,000 rupees to 1 lakh rupees to their salary. Uh, to the salaries of first officers every month. An email that Vistara sent to pilots stated that pilots who do not sign the revised contract will not be allocated a slot on the upgrade sequence list, they will not receive the one-time payout and it will be considered that they do not wish to join Air India once the merger is approved and consequently they will not be included in the transition to Air India and which is what explains why so many pilots of Vistara are reporting sick. All right. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Madiha, as well as Danish, for getting us those important, uh, you know, developments uh, that is impacting Absolutely. all the consumers. Uh, and, uh, you know, aviation is just so important for uh, the economic, uh, you know, transition of the country also. So this is a big, big uh, concern and we'll keep getting you all the latest details on Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Madiha, for that. Uh, but let's also get you some updates from the courts. The Supreme Court hearing... The contempt case against Patanjali Ayurveda and Baba Ramdev rejected Baba Ramdev's apology in the misleading ads case and has allowed them one more opportunity to explain their action. The court also demanded that Baba Ramdev be present for the next hearing. My colleague Ashmit is here to tell us more. Ashmit. 
Well, uh, Baba Ramdev facing contempt proceedings essentially because despite the Supreme Court's restraint on Patanjali Arvey, it had continued to publish advertisements that were one, uh, made a mockery of allopathic medicine and number two, published uh, advertisements about products that claim to be a cure for everything from COVID uh, and uh, to cancer. Now, he was made to appear in person. He did appear in person. Uh, the Supreme Court, however, did not uh, express... Uh, in fact, uh, did not stop short of expressing its frustration at Baba Ramdev. Number one, the Supreme Court pointed out that uh, its apology, apology by Baba Ramdev is not good enough. It's accepting uh, this apology with a sack full of salt. It is not impressed uh, with this apology, going on to observe that uh, Baba Ramdev, the stature that he occupies in society, uh, imposes upon him a higher benchmark of compliance with Supreme Court directions, that he was fully aware of the Supreme Court directions. There was belligerence, there was defiance of these Supreme Court orders that is simply not tenable and that they are inclined towards taking these contempt proceedings to their logical conclusion. However, Baba Ramdev was not the only one at the receiving end. The central government as well got a fair share from the bench as well. The Supreme Court observed uh, that the centre is keen on passing on the burden of taking action against Patanjali Arved to the state governments. Here, the Supreme Court pointed out that the central government's own committee had red flagged how some of these products were not backed by evidence and at best can be used as supplements to the COVID treatment. Yet, there has been no action inaction on part of the central government. So explanations being sought, not just from Baba Ramdev, as well as from the central government. The hearing is next week, and the Supreme Court has been very clear. It's not, still not impressed with Baba Ramdev. He needs to appear once again before the top court for a second time and make his case for an apology before the top court. All right, Tashmit, thanks a lot for that. Let's take a short break. When we return, we'll get you more news and updates on the other side. Stay tuned. All right, welcome back. Let's take it straight to election exchange. And Maharashtra has consistently been one of the highest attractors of foreign direct investment into the country. And this has become a big talking point ahead of the general elections. Now, in our continuing election series, election exchange, CNBC TV 18, Santhi Agora reports that almost every party is claiming the credit for this situation. <laughs> As home to India's financial capital, Maharashtra is seen as a hub for commerce. And its ability to attract foreign direct investment has been strengthened by its economically advanced status, the availability of skilled manpower and its strong manufacturing caliber. Encouraging state government policies have also helped. In FY21, with inflows of 1,19,000 crore rupees, Maharashtra stood at number one on the list of states with highest inflows. It retained the spot in FY22 despite the number slipping to 1,14,000 crores and found itself at the top of the list in FY23 with inflows of 1,18,000 crores. From the Eknath Shinde-led ruling Mahayuti Alliance to the earlier Uddhav Thakre-led Mahavikas Agadi, political parties are taking credit for this performance as they push to resonate with the urban voters. Today, we have a lot of potential here. The infrastructure is good. कनेक्टिविटी है, स्किल मैन पावर है, सब कुछ है और हमारी सिंगल विंडो क्लीयरेंस सिस्टम है, गवर्नमेंट ने पॉलिसी चेंज कर दी, सब्सिडी देते हम और जो नया इंडस्ट्री आता है, उसको रेड कार्पेट देते But some experts point out that Maharashtra's impressive FDI numbers are not a new phenomenon. As evidenced by Reserve Bank of India data, which shows Maharashtra remaining among the top five states in terms of FDI inflows between 2000 and 2012. They also point out that many of the companies that promised to come to the state have since shifted to other states due to better policies on offer. The urban water also studies all these things and they know that if FDI, they're going to bring in here. Say, for example, Foxconn, Vedanta. Where did it go? Gujarat. Airbus. Gujarat, bulk drug park, Gujarat. Why is everything going to Gujarat? Because this government, whatever they are doing, is on the lines of the Bharatiya Janata Party. And the, for Bharatiya Janata Party, you go, the bullet train goes from here to Ahmedabad. Everything rests in Gujarat. The opposition is also using this to poke holes in the claims being made by the BJP, the Ajit Pawar-led NCP and Eknath Shinde's Shiv Sena and says urban voters will see right through the state government's claims. Maharashtra has always been, since the opening of the economy, Maharashtra is a leader in attracting FDI, which constitutes about 27% at the national level. 
uh, as you uh, mentioned about Chief Minister, last time he said that he has attracted 1.50 lakh crore investment. What happened to that investment? I think the government will have to come out with a white paper. Despite a few setbacks, however, one cannot deny that foreign companies have shown interest in coming to Maharashtra over the last five years. Belgian drink and brewing company AB InBev with a plan to set up a 600 crore rupee plant and Microsoft investing 3,200 crore rupees to set up data centres in Pune are some of the latest to sign MOUs. And BGP and its allies are sure to make the consequent promise of jobs and potential for better infrastructure to try and win votes. In Mumbai, Santia Gora. Okay, that's election exchange. Thanks a lot, Santia, for that. With that, it's curtains down on this edition of Business Lunch. Thanks a lot for watching.